okay? I'm here to tell you something. Your life and success in your life has absolutely nothing to do with how well you can do it. It has everything to do with how much can you believe that God can do it. Okay, there is very little that we have to do in order to achieve the blessing of God because Jesus has already done it all. Oh. Let me free you this evening to say, there is very little that you have to do in order to experience the freedom and the life of Christ other than believing that he did exactly what he did. Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? I hope you're doing amazing. Um, I'm doing great and excited because I'm starting to see God do some really amazing things in my own personal life. Um, and so that's very exciting. And I'm here to tell you, God will do amazing things in your life if you just believe that he will. Um, so I want to jump into my message tonight uh, because I want to teach uh, a part two to the message that I preached, I think, two Sundays ago about the puzzle. Um, and so I want to do a part two. Uh, but before I do, I have two words for two different people. Um, so... Jerry, stand up, my brother Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Um, so when I was just in worship tonight, uh, I was just asking the Lord what he wanted to say. Because um, one of the things that I will say to everybody is the Lord is always speaking. Um, and sometimes you see people come up here and they're giving these words or whatever, and you're thinking, wow, that's so amazing. I, I want to tell you that each and every one of you has the same Holy Spirit in you as I have in me. Um, there's nothing special about somebody who gives a prophetic word. Um, it's, it's ultimately just learning how to tap into what the Holy Spirit is doing and what he's saying. Because he's always speaking to everybody. Um, and so, yeah, go after that yourself. So anyways, Jerry, um, when I saw what was happening around you was I saw your angel and he was sitting beside you, he was sitting at a desk. And um, like it was an old school style desk, like one of the ones that you would have sat in like in high school or whatever. Um, and he was just writing, like drawing all over a piece of paper, like squiggly lines and everything. And I'm kind of watching him do it. And he's, it seems like he's having just like a lot of fun or whatever, and he's drawing it. And then what he does is he takes his hand and he moves it over top of the piece of paper and all the lines become straight. And, you know, he takes the page and kind of just throws it away, pulls a new piece of paper out and just starts squiggling all over the piece of paper. And then he moves his hand over top of it and the lines become straight. And he keeps doing this time after time, and I'm trying to figure out what he's doing. And I'm thinking, is this something, or is this just, you know, him just doing something weird? And I asked the Lord, Lord, what does this mean? And I felt like what the Lord said was that you're coming into a season in your life now where the Lord is going to make, um, like, squiggly places straight. And what I felt like he meant by this, not that, like, your life is this squiggly mess, because that's not what the Lord is saying at all. But what I, yeah, necessarily, I mean, whatever. But what I felt like what the Lord said is, is that he's taking all the different intersections because I know a little, do know a little bit about you. Um, and I know that you're the kind of guy who's always got a lot of things happening all at the same time. And I felt like what the Lord said is that where there's been a lot of intersections in your life, you know, where you've got, you know, this road going in this direction and this thing going in this direction and this thing going in this direction and this going in this direction. I feel like what the Lord said is that you're coming into a season now where it's going to be like the Lord gives you almost like supernatural wisdom to understand how all the pieces come together. And because of that, it's going to be like where there's always been a whole bunch of, you know, squiggly lines everywhere. It's going to be like, boom, this thing is like straight and it makes sense. I believe it's going to be like a season of like great vision for you and also great understanding of like this next chapter that um, I believe that the Lord is really desiring to bring you into. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So stretch your hand towards him. Heavenly Father, we're thanking you for Jerry, Lord, for just the amazing man that you've called him to be. I feel like what the Lord is just saying to you is like the more that you press into the Lord, the more that you're going to begin to discover the reason that God put you here on the earth. Um, it's almost like I'm seeing that, that there's like a longing on the inside of you because it's like you, you know that there is so much more in you than what you've seen. And I feel like what the Lord is saying is that 
uh, that's what this season is all about for you. It's like there's going to be such a clarity to you that your mind is not going to be like encumbered by all the different decisions that you have to make. But through this clarity that the Lord is giving you, it's going to be like all of a sudden now you're able to see things in your life clearly. And so it's going to give you time to begin to discover things in yourself. And so, Lord, we bless that. We bless the amazing gift that you put on the inside of him. And we declare that his best is yet to come in Jesus name. Amen. Yay, Jerry. Uh, next person, Stephanie, way at the back. Hey, what's up? You can stand up. Um, I actually didn't know who it was back there, and I, and I thought that it was you, and I'm thinking, I really hope that this is Stephanie, because you're kind of in the, in the dark in the back. Um, so, Stephanie, when I was asking uh, the Lord what was going on, because I knew that he highlighted you for a reason, I saw your angel, and when I saw it, it was holding a torch. Um, and at first I thought it was the Statue of Liberty, but it wasn't. Um, that was my natural reasoning. I think, what's the person that holds a torch? It wasn't the Statue of Liberty. Um, but when I asked the Lord what it was doing, the Lord reminded me of the, the passage of Scripture in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins, right? And how, you know, we know there's five, the, he calls five of them the foolish virgins, and five of them are the non-foolish virgins, the smart virgins. Um, and basically the whole story is, is that five of them, because they have, you know, they have kept enough oil uh, they basically get to go into their promise. And because there's five of them that didn't keep their oil, five of them missed their promise. And I felt like when I asked the Lord what he was saying is, is I feel like what the Lord needs you to know is that, uh, like, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I feel like the Lord wants you to know that you have been faithful with the oil that the Lord has given to you. Um, and sometimes what can happen to us is the enemy can lie to us and make us feel like, we identify more with the foolish virgins than we identify with the smart virgins. But I feel like the Lord wanted me, like I saw your angel holding that lantern and the Lord just wanted me to let you know that he sees you as one of those smart, the, you know, the smart women. And, and, and in the sense that I feel like what the Lord is inviting you into in this new season is, is a time for you to begin to like go into the kingdom of, of God, right? And not like you need to get saved because like we all know that you're saved. But I feel like what he is referring to that is, is that he's inviting you to an opportunity because of your faithfulness with what he's given to you. He's inviting you to come into the kingdom to experience the dreams that God has put on the inside of your heart. And so I feel like, you know, you know, for whatever, I don't know what God is doing in your life right now, but I feel like what the Lord just wants you to do is to like silence all the thoughts in your head that would make you feel like you deserve anything less than the absolute best that God has for you. Um, because if he calls you, you know, one of the smart women, then that's the way that you have to identify with yourself. Okay. So just write your hands with her. Lord, we just bless Stephanie for what you're doing in her life, Lord. God, we're just calling forth the amazing gifts and talents that you've put on the inside of her. And Heavenly Father, we know that you have great plans for her. And so Lord, we're calling just everything in her life to align so that she can begin to focus on what you're asking her to do instead of trying to figure out how to make her own life work. Lord, I declare that the promises of God, let them come alive on the inside of our heart. Let them be aw awakened on the inside of our heart. Let dreams and visions and passions be awakened in your heart. I feel like, you, like what the Lord just wants you to know is like there is, like there is destiny on the inside of you and the Lord is going to keep calling that out on the inside of you because God wants you to do so much more than you could imagine doing on your own. And there's nothing that this world has, and not saying that you're worldly, but there's no good thing that this world can offer you that would even slightly compare with the amazing things that God has for you in your future. And so, Lord, we bless that. We bless her destiny. We bless her dreams. Lord, and we declare, God, that she'll experience everything that you've promised her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, so, is everybody doing good? Yay. Yay amen. Um, I'm really excited because, you know, one of the reasons why I love really where God has me in my own personal life, uh, and ultimately in my messages, like here's a little FYI into my life, really my messages are just an invitation for all of you to come into my life, to the, the things that God has been doing in my life. Um, and really this last two years, if I had to say what God was doing, is he's been unraveling the scriptures and Christianity to me to a place where I've begun to understand that living a lifestyle of success in Christianity is actually easy. Okay? Uh, history and religion and the enemy and things like that have made us believe that it's difficult to live successfully in the kingdom 
but I'm here to tell you, if you hear nothing else from me tonight, is that you can achieve the highest level of success in Christianity, and you can do it basically with knowing very little. Amen. Okay? Can I get an amen to that? Amen. I mean, it, it, this is scriptural. The Bible says that unless we, unless we come as what? A child right? We'll never be able to enter the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but the last time I talked to a child, they weren't exactly wise. You know, it wasn't like they had memorized a thousand scriptures, but I believe that what, what, what uh, like, you know, this whole idea of slavery and sonship, which is really where God has the church right now at large, is under, coming into and understanding our sonship. And one of the things that when we don't understand our sonship is we enter into this level of performance where we're constantly feeling like we have to be better in order to achieve more in God. Okay, I'm here to tell you something. Your life and success in your life has absolutely nothing to do with how well you can do it. It has everything to do with how much can you believe that God can do it. Okay, there is very little that we have to do in order to achieve the blessing of God because Jesus has already done it all. Oh. Let me free you this evening to say... There is very little that you have to do in order to experience the freedom and the life of Christ other than believing that he did exactly what he did. Oh, let me free you tonight and tell you this, that in order for us to experience all that God has for us to experience, our part is very little compared to the large part that Jesus has already done for us. Thank you. All right. That's right. Be free. Be free. But the thing that the enemy tries to do to us, and, and also like intellectualism, which has really been so pervasive in our culture, is we feel like the smart people or the, you know, the bright people or the disciplined people or the, that those are the people that are going to experience it. But I'm just not one of those people. Okay. Let me tell you something. When Jesus chose his disciples, he did not choose the best of the best. He did not choose the scholars. He didn't choose the elite of the society. He chose none of those things. He chose the simple people. Why? Because he wanted it to be an expression to us that everybody can experience all that God has for you. That it doesn't matter whether you went to university or not, whether you have a business or not, whether you've succeeded or failed in your past. None of those things matter because Jesus has already been the determining factor as to whether or not we're going to be blessed. Stop trying to be blessed and just believe that you are blessed. Well, the gospel in a nutshell. You see, so often we fight so hard to try to be good enough or to try to have our life together enough that somehow we feel like in the result of that, that now we're going to qualify for the blessing. None of those things are going to be the ter ter determining factor. Although when your life is blessed and the word is in your life, your life is going to look orderly. Your, your, you know, your affairs are going to be in order, right? You're going to be a loving person. All those things are going to happen as a result of the word, but blessing doesn't come as a result of those things. Blessing comes as a result of one thing that I believe the word more than I believe my situations. That's it. Everything that we learn here, everything that my dad takes so many hours to teach us is all trying to, as desperately as possible to get us to understand that the reality in the word, even though it's just, you know, on, in uh, black ink on a white piece of paper, that this reality is more real than any situation you may be experiencing. Okay, years ago, he taught us, right, about the understanding of the difference between truth and facts. Okay, the fact is that you maybe don't have any money in your bank account, but that's just a fact, and facts have to come under, they have to submit themselves to the truth. The truth that says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And so I don't care what my facts say. 
I don't care what my emotions are telling me. I don't care what my thoughts are telling me. I'm choosing, actively choosing to believe what this says more than I believe what my emotions or my thoughts or my reality is saying. Because as I can believe this more than I believe what's happening around me in any situation, okay, get this. There is no situation that is more powerful. The scripture says that Jesus has been given what? The name that is above most names. The name that's above almost all names except for a few. No, the scripture says he's been given what? The name above all names. You know, I did a really extensive study on what the word all means. And I'm here to tell you that the word all means all. (laughs) Okay? The word all means all. That means that as I submit to what? The name of Jesus. What's the name of Jesus? Jesus is the word. And so as I submit myself and choose to believe this and quote this, confess this, think about this, do this, as I just keep moving forward with this being more real to me than my situations, my situations, get this, they must submit to the word. Why? Because Jesus, the word, has the highest authority. It's been given the name that's above every other name. So, If there's a name, and let's say it's called sickness, and I say, well, I have this word, and it's called cancer. And I also have this word, and it's called Jesus. And the name of Jesus is higher than the word cancer. Well, that means if I can just believe that Jesus is more real than my doctor said my cancer is real, then what? My cancer must now submit to what Jesus has to say about the cancer. That will work in every single area of our life. Our part is simply to discipline ourselves to do whatever it takes to get this in here. That's it. The New Testament is all about getting this. Let me tell you, God did not give us the Bible so it could condemn us, right? He did not give us the Bible so that it could be a hammer to crush us or for us to crush others. Maybe that's more appropriate. (laughs) He gave us the word, why? So we could be free. So I could experience not what I can do on my own, but I can experience everything that Jesus purchased for me. There is no limit. Like, this is crazy. Like, think about this for long enough. Like, you have something that breaks every limitation in your life. If you can just believe this more than any situation you're facing, The situation must submit itself to the word. And so two weeks ago on Sunday, we read from the passage of scripture in Philippians 3. um, And it's when Paul is talking and he makes the statement, Philippians 3, 12 to 14, he says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already, actually, Heavenly Father, we just welcome you in this place. Sometimes he interrupts me. He's like, oh, you got to pray, man. (laughs) I get so excited. So we just invite you into this place, Holy Spirit. Lord, my words are nothing without your anointing. And so I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would anoint my words, that you would anoint this atmosphere, that you would charge it with faith and expectation. God, because we know that you, you said that your word has enough power in it to break us free from any chain, to loose us from any bit of bondage. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to the, the teaching of the word because we desire to live free. So, Father, 
charge this atmosphere, anoint it. We declare we'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Philippians 3.12 says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus has first possessed for me. Okay, here it is. Paul giving us a perfect, he said it perfectly. Okay, Jesus purchased your perfection. Our journey is not trying to be perfect so that Jesus is happy with us. Our journey is I'm trying to be more perfect because Jesus has already made me perfect. He's not waiting for you to be perfect in order to now qualify to do or have great things. Okay? I'm pressing on to perfection because I don't know about you, but I would love for my life to be perfect. Okay? I mean, I don't know about you. You could settle for hard times, but I would like my life to be perfect in every area. Okay? But I'm pressing on. Why? Because Jesus has already done it. Okay, he was aware that we're not perfect. And because we knew we weren't perfect, he went ahead and paid the price for our perfection. And so now in him, we can experience everything that we desire. Okay, so he says, but I press on to profess that perfection for which Christ has possessed for me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. The secret, right? The secret to entering the kingdom, right? Focusing on what is to come. So I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. So this is the whole thing, right? We've been talking about this really since the beginning of the year uh, and really through all of last year, really to come to an understanding of what it looks like to live a life of faith and live a life of authority, okay? Right, when my dad at the beginning of the year, the Lord spoke to him the prophetic word over the church for the year, you know, we had this great banner that it's the year of the great harvest, right? And, and, and I believe that what God is desiring to do this year more than ever is to teach us how do we take this concept off of the banner and put it into our lives, okay? I mean, I've said this a thousand times, right? But like, I've heard so many prophetic words, and I've heard people say so many amazing things over years, you know, that it's the year of the open door, you know, and it's the year of the fulfillment, and it's the year of the promise. But you know what? Unfortunately, I've gone through all these years, you know, the last 25 years of prophetic words over all the great things that God wants to do, and truthfully, I've experienced very little. Let me just be totally frank with you. I haven't experienced the, 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 to the magnitude of what I could have experienced, I haven't experienced it, but I have determined in myself this year that if this is what God is looking to do, then I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to believe this more than I believe any sort of deficit that I may experience in my own life. Because the only, the only thing that can stop what God is trying to do is my disbelief in the fact that I can actually experience that thing. When I say to you, it's your year of great harvest, every single thing that you've been believing God for is going to happen this year, right? How does that make you feel? Okay? Some of you makes you feel good, right? And if maybe you were like me in years gone by, right, my response was, yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it. You know, I've been a part of the hoopla services, you know, the 24-hour prayer nights where we really, you know, bring in the new year because of what God, you know, and then I end the year worse than I started the year, and I'm thinking, you know, what the hey, right? But I'm telling you something, it doesn't have to be that way. If God is prophetically declaring that this is what you can experience, Okay, don't get offended, but it would be foolish for us. We would be dum-dums for us to not do whatever it takes in order to experience this in our life. Like, let me give you an example. If you're believing God for healing and the Lord is saying, this is your year of great harvest, okay, you would be a dum-dum. I would be a dum-dum if I did not do whatever was necessary in order to see my healing manifested. Can I be honest? Like, this is, and, and, and like I'm saying, I'm bringing you into what God is saying to me, right? He's saying, hey, you dumb dumb. It's time that you do something, right? Okay? 
But this is the thing is that sometimes is that we can, it's almost like these words, right? They just sort of start to slip through our fingers, right? That God gives us this amazing word and it's not too long. I mean, we're literally only into this, into this year by what, two and a half months. And it's like, I can already feel it sometimes in my own life. Like it wants to just slip through my fingers. But I tell you something, like I am determined that my life is not going to look the same way at the end of this year as it did in the beginning. Like, I am not going to be okay with the fact that if I started this year with a deficit in certain areas of my life, I am determined to do whatever it takes in order to see that deficit made right. Why? Because if Jesus already paid for it, I would be a dumb dumb to not experience everything that God desired to do. But that's the lie of the enemy. It's too hard. It'll never happen for you. Right? Or maybe it's our laziness. Right? Where it's like, you know, I was like this in times gone by. Where I'm like, I'm going to do my confessions every day. And then I wake up the next day and I forget to do my confessions. Right? (laughs) But let me tell you something. The enemy loves that. He loves when God opens up the windows of heaven to pour out the blessing. And then he can trick us to feel like it's never going to happen to you. And in so many people's lives, we believe this. And because we believe it, we never experience, right? I get sad and angry because I want more. And God, what's happening? And God, uh. When all I have to do is do whatever it takes to get this in here. Like, if you've got to read it a thousand times, it's better than dying. Okay, like, maybe that's revelation to you, okay? Like, it's better than losing your house. But Gloria Copeland makes a statement. She said, most people would rather die than do what it takes in order to get free. Why? Because the enemy lies to us to make us feel inferior rather than understanding I was born for this. I was born to succeed. Like, I don't know about you, but I was born for victory. The, the DNA that runs through my body Do you know who I share DNA with? My dad. I I do actually share it with my dad. No, God Almighty. You were born to win whatever battle you're in. You know, there's already a time happening right now in the future where God is living in your victory. (laughs) Okay? I'm not. Sorry, this is slow, man. This is slow. This is not even my notes. God already sees you in your perfection. So what do I do? Do whatever it takes to get this in here. Do whatever it takes to believe the promises from in here more than I believe my situations. What does that look like? You got to make some confessions. Okay? If you're not making your confessions, at least no condemnation. Okay? (laughs) I'm not here to condemn you. Okay? Let the word condemn you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Okay? I'm not here to condemn you. Okay? But if you're not making your confessions every day, I'll tell you what that says about you. You don't know who you are. That's the truth. This is your, uh, like, rule book. 
And the enemy is breaking a whole bunch of rules in your life. And because we don't spend enough time knowing this, he's breaking all the rules, making us sick and poor, stealing your happiness, stealing your peace. But because what? We're just not opening our mouths saying, hey, wait a minute. You, 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 you can't do that. I'll tell you something, when you know who you are and what is yours, you talk about it a lot. Like you ever notice that when you get something new that is yours and you love it, it's not hard to talk about it. You're like snapping shots of it on Instagram and you're writing a blog about it on Facebook. Okay, that is this, this is yours. But what? The enemy tries to get us to believe what? You aren't good enough. I know you want this, but it just will never happen for you. I know that Jesus went to the cross and paid a high price in order for you to experience healing but he doesn't love you enough to give it to you. I know you tried and tried, but you just aren't one of the special ones that God wants. And what happens? I believe that more than I believe this. And I never experience this. I mean, like how simple. Like I had the Lord say it to me two years ago. He was talking to me about this process and he says like, you know, if you're believing to live supernaturally, you actually have to start living supernaturally, right? And I'm like, mind blown, right? Like, I want to live this way. Like, I have, I have, you know, sold all that I had, bought all my shares in this, which we all have. And the Lord is looking to us saying like, hey, yo, like, it's time to actually start doing the things that you bought your shares in. It's time to, like, if you aren't got this word playing all the time, okay, like, don't get me wrong. I love Netflix, Netflix binges, right? <laughs> Ask my wife, okay? Like, sometimes she'll wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm, like, sitting there watching on my <laughs> tiny little iPad. Or sometimes I, like, turn the other way in bed, and I prop my iPhone up, right? Because I'm, like, I love to binge. But she'll come to me and say, what is this doing for you? <laughs> yeah, she's tough, man. <laughs> don't, don't you cross her. She's tough. But she'll say that to me. You know? She'll be like, why are you putting the office on? It's 8.30 in the morning. And I'm like, I don't know why I'm watching the office right now. <laughs> but I tell you something, that's real. Why? Because I don't, it evidence to me, what? That I don't know who I am. And not that it's condemning me, but it's actually starting to make me angry. Because then I go and look at my bank account and I see that it's not where I want it to be and I get upset and down on myself. Why? Because I spend too much time watching The Office and not enough time listening to teachings. Okay, like, can I make it very simple this evening? That is it. Like, you want to know the key to living successfully in, the war, in, in what God has promised you? Okay, I'll tell you this. Spend more time with God than without God. Okay, like, that's it. If you spend eight hours a day at your job without God and 15 minutes in the morning with God, this is true, okay? This is just the way, let me tell you, this is, this is not on my notes. This is the Lord, because I'm like, Lord, I want to preach this, okay? <clears throat> this is just the way our brain works, okay? Whatever you give your attention to is what your heart begins to believe, and so if you get around people at your job, and they're talking about their sickness and their lack 
right? And their failed relationships. And you think that, I think that, my 15 minutes of the morning of, you know, really quickly, you know, going through my Our Father prayer sheet is somehow going to make a difference. I'm going to tell you something. It is not. Okay? That's why the scripture says in Mark chapter 4, with what my dad has been preaching for years, what, you know, the word, the seed gets planted, and what happens? Immediately, the devil comes and makes sure that you hear something that's going to come and what? Uproot the word and steal it. You wake up in the morning and you're like, thank you, Lord, for my finances. And then you go to work and you hear, you know, Billy Bob, you know, talking about all of his financial woes. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have those too. What happened? The enemy came, you know, you had your moment with the truth. The enemy came, he uprooted the truth. And now what happens? You're actually worse than you were before you started. Less belief in the word, more discouraged. I tell you, that's why the scripture says very clearly what, that the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I heard my dad was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and talking about the book, The Final Quest. If you haven't read that book, it's by Rick Joyner. It is a must read. Like, must read every month for the rest of your life. <laughs> When you read this account, you realize the enemy is mobilized against you. He does not want us as the body of Christ to live in this. It must be intentional on purpose that I'm doing whatever is necessary in order to make sure this and this is more real to me than the situations that I'm facing in my life. Because, right, in, in, John, in 3 John 1, 2, this is what the Lord says to us, right? Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Like, you are not fighting against God to try to get God to give you a blessing, right? God's highest desire in our life is that we would experience this, right? God doesn't release a prophetic word over the year so that he can, you know, like you ever see those things with the donkey who's got the carrot in front of him, right? And the donkey's going and what he never ends up getting. That's not what prophetic words are. Prophetic words are God making us aware of what's available to us right now. God's highest desire, right? According to John is that we would experience Blessing, prosperity, health in every area of our life. That is God's highest desire. So what stops it? One thing. Do I believe? Do I believe? Do I believe? How do I believe? I do the do's. I do my confessions. I do read the word. I do pray. I do listen to teachings. I do meditate. Why? Because then I'm going to get the gold stars by my name and I'm going to get enough gold stars like in Sunday school, you know, bless you Sunday school. No, that's why we don't do that here. Not our Sunday school. My Sunday school, you know, just getting me into performance all sorts of ways, right? The gold star, like, oh, you get a gold star for being good. That's not, we don't do our confessions because we get heavenly gold stars. I do my confessions and everything that I do so that this eventually, that's why Joshua 1 Nate, what? Meditate on the word day and night. Why? So that you may observe to do all that's written. I'm challenging you. I feel like heaven is challenging us to be those people who will do whatever we need to do. Like if you've got to say, set a buzzer that buzzes you every hour, and every hour you pull out your confession card, do it. 
If you got to set aside, wake up an hour early in the morning so that you could spend time with the Lord, do it. If you got to fast your lunch so that you can go sit in your car and pray in tongues, do it. Why? Because the end, oh, it's so worth it. Like, you ever have those things? It's like you go to the gym. It's a perfect example, you know? You're suffering, you know, you're sore, you're whatever. I always experience this with people. They're like, teach me how to work me out, teach me how to work out, help me. And I'm like, okay, sure. And they go to the gym and they're, you know, bench pressing, they're doing the thing, they're squatting. And they're crying to me about, oh, my legs, oh, my chest. But then there's this magical thing that happens at the three-month point. As they walk by the mirror, and it's always the tricep. <laughs> always. It's always the tricep. They walk by the mirror, and as they walk, they notice <laughs> the tricep just kind of winks at them. <laughs> and what happens? In that moment, all of a sudden, all the pain, all the suffering, all the discipline is worth it. It's the same thing in the Word. Yes, is it going to be a couple months of discipline? You better believe it. Is it going to be, maybe you're going to say your confessions a thousand times before you, know, you notice anything? Probably. But I tell you something, there will come a day when you're going to walk by that mirror and you're going to be like, my arm is getting big. <laughs> and all of a sudden, what happens? Now, pain becomes pleasure. Now, discipline becomes excitement. That is the ease of the New Testament. Entering into something that's already ours. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the beauty of your word. Lord, we know that your promises, you said that they are yes and they're amen. You said that he who gave the promise is faithful to complete it. So tonight, Heavenly Father, we choose to discipline ourselves, to do what it takes to experience all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.